All right, so today we're going to learn how to use the command line, which is a different way of running your programs and what you've been doing so far, running them from Eclipse. We're going to learn different ways you can get input from the user. So you can get in input from the user interactively. You can get user from input from the user from a file. And we're also going to look at how you can make the output of one program the input to another program. We're also going to look a little more closely at arrays. So we've seen these briefly uh, in your programs. You've been using the args array in the main method in order to get input from your program. We're going to look at arrays in a little more detail and look at how you can create and use your own arrays in your programs. You're probably used to interacting with your computer with a graphical user interface. So if you're using Windows or Mac OS, uh, you probably use a graphical user interface. So you drag things around. You have a mouse and menus and icons and so on. And today it's the predominant way people interact with computers. And it has a lot of advantages. Here's one of the you know, original GUIs here this is at Xerox PARC and then one of the early versions of the uh, Macintosh computer. And they caught on quite, quite, quite well. These sort of GUI interfaces are better for novices because they're uh, no commands to remember. You've got rich output. You've got graphics and sound, and you can use your your mouse to input things. Uh, these days, there's a lot of uh, touch interfaces, multi-touch, like your iPhone and so on. Uh, so they are the predominant way people interact with computers. But it's not the only way you can interact with a computer. Uh, a way that used to be uh, quite popular was a command line interface and originally at least after punch cards anyway it was the only option and you would interact with your computer by typing commands you'd have to know what these commands were so you had to be somewhat of an expert in order to use a command line interface but the command line does offer some advantages over a graphical user interface it can in fact be faster for experts to do things with a command line interface than compared to a GUI it's easier to automate tasks so you could rather than you know do a repetitive action in a graphical user interface you might be able to just automate it in a command line interface and finally as we'll look at you can also use the command line to hook programs together so you can combine the functionality of a series of programs to achieve some some objective first of all to use the command line, you first have to figure out how to start it. And this depends on what operating system you're using. I'm using Windows machine here, and so I'll show you that. You can start a command shell in Windows by going to the Start menu and typing CMD, for uh, short for Command. Or another way to get to the same thing is to go into the Start Program, All Programs, Accessories, and then Command Prompt. And, and this is for Windows 7. If you're in a Mac OS, you could go to the Spotlight, type Terminal, or alternatively go to the Applications folder, folder Utilities, and then Terminal. So why don't we uh, try that out right now? I can just go to the Start menu, type CMD, and hit Enter. And there we go, I have a command shell. And what you see, and we make it a little bigger, what you see in the command shell here is a blinking cursor. So this is where I type my commands. And I can type what I, whatever command I want and then hit Enter. And it will try and do whatever I told it. Obviously, that's not a, a valid command. Other features of the command shell you see are it's showing me my current location on my computer. Just like if I go into my computer, these are two views of the same thing. The command line is not different from navigating with something like my computer. I can go to the C drive and I can find the users folder uh, and the Keith subfolder. This is the same directory that I'm in in the command line. One thing you can do at the command line is you can see what kind of files are in there. That's DIR in DOS. If you're using Mac OS or Linux it'd be a command LS. And you can see we'll see the same folders and the same files that are available in my computer in the GUI are available in the command line interface. Just like in the my computer I can move back a level. You can move back a level in the command line 
And to do that, you use the cd command. cd is short for change directory. And dot dot, so period period, moves you back a level in, in the command line interface. So now we're in the users directory. And if I do dot dot again, I'm now in the root directory of my uh, hard drive on my computer. If I want to find, often what you're going to do in the command line is go and find your project, your Eclipse project. And I'm storing my Eclipse projects for the course in a folder called Dropbox. I can go down the directory tree by doing CD and then the name of it. So if you go in my C drive, you'll see there's a Dropbox folder right there. And so I've moved into the Dropbox folder. Inside that folder, I have another folder called mtech. And inside that folder, I have the folder for this course. And inside that folder, I have a workspace directory. And I can do a DIR and see what, what's in there. And you can see I have three or four different projects set up in my, my Eclipse directory. CD, and I want to go to the command line project. And you can auto-complete either in, in Windows or in Mac OS by hitting the tab key. So you notice I didn't type that whole thing. I could type this whole thing out, but it would take quite a while. So if I hit the tab key, it will auto-complete with uh, a file or a directory that's in, in the current location. If I don't complete the whole thing in Windows, it will cycle through the possibilities. And so we can change into that directory. Another good thing to know when you're using command line is you can back, you can use the up arrow and the down arrow to navigate to pass commands to save you some typing. And there we are inside the project directory. Here's a list of some useful commands if you're using the command line. I've shown you some of them. CD to change into a particular folder. CD dot dot to go back a level. You can also go directly using an absolute path like this one here. And in Windows you'll be using backslash and in uh, Mac OS or Unix you need to use forward slash. On Windows you use DIR to get a listing. On Mac OS or Unix you need to use LS. Compiling a program is the same on both. It's just Java C and then the name of the Java source file. If you want to run a program, so if you've compiled prog.java with Java C, you then have a prog.class file. You're going to run the program using Java and then prog. Notice you just use prog. If you put the dot class in there, it's not going to work. Often you might want to just see what's in a file, maybe a source file or a, a data file in the directory. And in DOS you can type type and then the name of the file, whereas on Mac OS or Unix you can type the more command. So that's the basics. We'll be seeing more of the command line uh, through this lecture. But let's talk a little bit about getting input. Thus far we've just been getting input from the args array that comes into the main method. And this kind of works, but it's kind of tedious. If you have a lot of input, it's going to be difficult to enter all that input on the command line and it's also problematic because it's impossible to get interactive input so your program may be a conversation between the program and the person like for example this number hunt game I'm showing here the the program has guessed as assigned a random number between 1 and 100 and it's the person's the human's job to try and guess it and the computer gives hints about whether you're hot or cold depending on what number you guess uh, you wouldn't be able to do this just with, with the command line. To get input from the user, and as I'll show you, you can also get input from a, a, a saved text file, we're going to use a helper class called standardin.java. So your, your textbook talks about it. Uh, you can download it from the course website or from the, uh, the textbook website. It's just a helper class that makes it easy to get input from the user or from the file from this this thing called standard input. There are a variety of ways you could install this so Java could find it. We're going to use a very simple approach is we're just going to place this standard in.java file in the same directory as the program that requires it. So this means you know you're going to maybe have a bunch of versions of standard in.java running around your computer but yeah that's okay the computers are have big hard drives these days Here's an example program that uses standard in it 
prompts the person to enter an integer and then it reads an integer and puts it into num1, prompts for a second integer, then copies it into num2, computes the sum, and then prints it out. So a very, very simple calculator. Let's have a look at that in Eclipse. All right, and if you run this, you can run this in Eclipse. And when you run this, the program will do the prompt. And then what it's doing is waiting for you to enter something down here in, in the console window. So I could enter a number like 2, enter a number like 3, and it'll print out 15. Oh, why does it print out 15? That's because I uh, was mucking around with this. I was timesing that by 3. We can make that change, and now it'll hopefully compute to some 5. You can run it from in here. Let me show you how you run it from the command line. Add 2. Now, if you do this, that's not going to work. All right, recall, you can't put the class name there. You must just do add 2, and then I can do 2 and 3 to get 5. Two ways to do the same thing. If I wanted to recompile from the command line, I could do this, add 2.java. That will recompile add2.java to add2.class. Whenever you make a change up here and save it, Eclipse is going to recompile that Java program and make a new class file. So now if I go to the command line and run add2, you should see that it's now multiplying the addition by 2. So whenever you save an Eclipse, it also compiles the class file. And I recommend if you've used the preferences files on the website or as long as when you create your project in Eclipse, I always recommend file new Java project and you give it a name that you select this first project layout. This puts the Java file and the class file all in the same directory and it's it's less confusing that way. If you If you do set up a project this way, what you're going to see is you have got a source, an SRC folder, and a bin folder and uh, Eclipse puts a Java in one and then whenever it compiles it compiles the class file into the other directory which gets a bit confusing when you go to the command line and are uh, working on your program there. You can also use standard in to read input from a text file. So rather than have a person sit there and type a bunch of numbers in, you can also read it in from some file you've saved off in advance. And standard in can read and detect when it reaches the end of the file. All right. If you're doing this interactively, if you're entering the numbers, then you have to terminate by hitting Control Z or Control D, depending on uh, whether you're in Windows or Mac OS. Here's an example program. Its goal in life is to sum up numbers. It's using a new method I haven't, you haven't seen before in standard in called isEmpty. IsEmpty returns true when the file is out of data or when the input stream is when somebody's hit control Z or control D. So by putting the exclamation mark, we negate that. And basically, this loop keeps looping as long as there's data coming in from the input, be it a file or be it interactive user input reads it in as an integer and then adds it to its ongoing sum variable and then once the input is done it prints out the, the sum. And we can run that so I've got some nums in Eclipse here. And if I run it interactively all right, it's like it's not doing anything. What's going on? It's actually waiting for input in the console window and I can give it some numbers and when I'm done I can hit control Z and it will produce a sum. It would just allow me I can enter as many numbers as I want and I can just keep going and going and going and going and it will just wait for me to hit control Z before it will do the final final output. Let's say we want to do that from a file though. So I've got a file on here called fournums.txt I just created in something like notepad. I can run some nums and I could do it interactively.
and it will work that way. But I can also run some nums and redirect from a file. So I can take four nums and send it into standard input. So I use the less than sign and then run it and get the output. Whatever's in this becomes the input for standard input. Now one thing I wanted to show you, I've already, before I started, I have had standard in in my package, my Java package with all my source files. But what if I don't have that in there? All right, let's move, I'll just move, let's just temporarily, so if I didn't have, if I hadn't downloaded this from the website, I just moved it out of directory, and I can do something like star.java to list all the source code, so I no longer have sta standard in in there, and then I'll update the Java project. This is what you'll see if you don't put Java standard in into the same directory. Eclipse is going to complain that it can't find standard in. And the thing to do then is actually to make sure you have standard in in the directory. So I just moved it back into my directory. So now I have standard in. But you also need to make sure you refresh your project. So I'm right clicking on the project name, going to refresh, and then the program is happy again. It won't realize uh, standard in is in there unless you refresh the project. Standard in has some other methods, so you've seen is empty and read int. It also has methods for reading doubles, reading longs, reading booleans, chars, strings, uh, entire lines, or everything in a file. And the difference, you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between read string and read line? They both read like text, right? And the difference is read string reads until the next bit of white space. Uh, it breaks up the text based on spaces or tabs or returns, whereas readline waits for the next return. So readline might, for example, in the example text file, if I started reading by calling standard in dot readline, it would read this entire first, this is an example text file, and return that as the string result from readline. Whereas if I instead called read string, it would read just the word this, then the word is, then the word an, and then example, and text, and file, and so on. It's important that if you know your, your, the format of your file, you need to call the right thing. So just like when you parse command line options, if you call the wrong method here and try and read, you know, read a double, but it's you know, actually a word, if I call read double on this file without reading in this first bit of text, it's going to actually throw an exception. You must match your calls to standard in to the data types that are in your input data. Besides reading in from a file, you can also send the console output. So whatever you use, whatever comes out of system.out.println, you can also redirect that to a file and save it off for later review or perhaps as input to another file. And furthermore, you can also do that without even writing to a file. To a file, you can take the output of one program and then do something called piping it into a second program. So I'm going to show you an example. The first program generates a, a bunch of random numbers. You tell it how many, it generates a whole sequence of random numbers, and that's all it does. The second program takes as input some sequence of numbers and then uh, computes the simple average of those numbers. Here are the two programs, rand, random nums and average nums. So random nums takes one command line argument, and then it just produces random numbers between 0 and 1. Uh, it produces that many of them, prints them to standard output. Average num reads from standard input as long as there's data and sums the next double and then increments its counter by 1. It needs to know how many doubles it read, it read in and the total sum and once all the data is done, then it can go ahead and compute the average, which is what, what this line does. All right. And as a reminder, is this doing correct division? Is it integer division? No. If the slash key looks to the left and looks to the right, it looks to the left, this sum variable is of type double. And so the slash is going to do normal floating point division, what you would expect and what you're, you're hoping for here. 
Let's show you that on the command line. Oh, and oh, I've crashed. Now remember, random number nums needed a command line argument, and I didn't give it to it. But it's good to be able to read these exceptions. You see exception in thread main. It's saying array index out of bounds exception. We called some array with an index of zero, but it was out of bounds. All right, and that would be in the args array. But these exceptions, if you find the last line, you can see on random nums Java, line eight is where the problem was. If you go to random nums and you've got your line numbering on, you can see that it crashed right there for for fairly obvious reasons. So I put that in, it produces five random numbers, and I can send that to a, a file if I want using the greater than. So I've typed space greater than space nums5. Nums5.txt is the file name. If I run that, I don't see any output. But if I do a directory and list all the text files, I see I have a text file called nums5, and that's where that output went. Once I have an output file, then I could run my average numbers, and I can use the less than symbol to read those numbers in from nums5.txt. And that's the average of those numbers. You can also do this without going via this file. I can type random nums and let's generate 10 random numbers. I can use the vertical bar, which is called the pipe. What this is doing is generating 10 random numbers and sending the output to the input of average numbers. It chain, chains the programs together. And then average numbers puts out outputs its, its average. So for 10 numbers, it was about that. 100 numbers, 0.52 thousand numbers so as you might expect a random number between 0 and 1 if we give it enough random numbers this is going to start to converge to 0 0.5 so chaining programs is something we might use later uh, it can be a handy way to combine the functionality of, of several programs and that's just uh, showing this slide is just showing that so let's talk about zombies. So you might be surprised to learn you know enough now, given you can now get input from a user and you know how to do conditionals, you know how to do loops, you know about data types and variables, you can actually build a simple game. Let me show you the game I built. It's called Zombie Apocalypse. I'll run it. And what you see here is I'm the explanation mark and the zombie is the asterisk and then the pound symbol is the mall. And I can give commands like east to move my guy east. I can give the command south to go south. And the game is to try and get to the mall without running into the zombie. He's trying to chase me there. And if I make it to there, I go to another level. And then the playground gets a little smaller and so on. And if I should happen to run into him, he's kind of running away from me now. Come on, zombie. Ah, he ran into the zombie and the game's over. How did I do that program? How did I represent the state of the person and how did I represent the, the state of that zombie? As you might expect, to track the person in the zombie is as simple as having two variables for each, an X and a Y, one for the person and one for the zombie. And how do I detect if I've hit the, the zombie? Well, if my X and Y are the same as the zombie's X and Y, well, then that's not boding very well for me. Here's the Java code that does that. Compare the X, my X, with the zombie's X, and my Y with zombie's Y, and if they're both equal, if both of those things are true, then that's it, the zombie got my brains. Simple enough. But let's say I want to make a little more complicated, more exciting game called Extreme Zombie Apocalypse. And this game is harder because there's two zombies uh, chasing me simultaneously. Well, it's straightforward extension, right? I can have two additional integer variables tracking the X and the Y location of the second zombie. Now my collision got a little more complicated. I've got to see, well, is my X equal to the first zombie's X 
and is my y equal to that first zombie's y if those you know those things both happen then i've hit the first zombie or the other thing that could happen is my x could be the second zombie x and my y could be the second zombie y in which case i'm also dead if either of these things is true if this top one is true or the second one is true then i've hit one zombie or the other simple enough well let's what if we want three zombies for super extreme zombie apocalypse we can add another pair of variables for zombie three and we can add another or to our if condition to test if i've hit the hit the zombie or not Well, I mean, you can see this is getting a little little tedious. What if I wanted a game like every level there's an additional zombie? There's really no good way to do this with just the simple variables uh, you've learned about so far. It just gets really tedious to represent this way. And so arrays are what we want, uh, or, or one way we can uh, address this. And we've already seen arrays in... Uh, the string bracket args that comes into our, our program and recall that all the command line arguments get copied into this array that we're calling args and you can refer to things the first thing in the array as args bracket 0 the second thing is 1 and the third is args bracket 2 and you can also test the array and find out how many things are in it but this is just kind of automatically passed into you. What if you want to make this zombie game and you need your own array? Or you need to track a bunch of things. So here's an example. You need to track 10 integer va variables. And you're going to initialize them with uh, values from 0 to 9 to start out with. Well, here's how you probably don't want to do it. Declare 10 different variables, a0 through a9, and then assign each of them. It's just long and tedious, right? And if you type any of these things wrong, like you type, you know, six here instead of five, okay, various things are going to go wrong. Here's how you do it with an array. You can create your own array. Here's the format. You must first give it the type. I want to store integers, so I, I say int. It's an array, so I need empty square brackets. I name the array. I'm going to call it A then I must create. This just declares to Java that I'm going to have an array named A, but you also need to create it. And when you create it, you must tell it how many slots you need. And in this case, I want 10 slots in my array. And you do that with a new keyword, and then you repeat this type. So this type always matches the type in the beginning. And then this specifies how many slots there are. And then once I have that, I can go ahead and uh, assign my values 0 through 9 to each of those slots. That was still a little tedious, right? And I can use a loop. Now that we know about loops, why go through it like that? I can create my, I can declare my array. So I've just split it up into two lines. I, went, I could have done it in one line. This line declares the array A. This line creates the array, makes those slots available. Then I loop over it. And I can use, inside of these square brackets, I don't have to put a literal number. I can put any int variable. i is an int, so I can use i inside of this. i is going to range from 0 up to, but not including, a dot length. So it's going to range from 0 to 9. And for each of those positions, it's going to put into a bracket 0, 0, a bracket 1, 1, and so on. Remember, we count from zero in computer science. The first element of array is always a bracket zero in Java. And you must never try and go to a bracket that's equal to the length. So in this case, I have an array of, of 10 positions, but don't make the common mistake of trying to do a bracket 10. A bracket 10 will crash, uh, will crash the program. Since we count from zero, zero counts as one of them, so you can never actually reach if you have 10 things, you're never going to have element index 10. You have element index 0 through 9. So watch out for that. That's a very common bug. Another popular bug is to use a less than or equal to here instead of the less than. You always want strictly less than the length, you know, the dot length 
of your array. Nice thing about arrays is they're easy to extend. You know, that was an example of an array of 10 items. Here's an example of an array of 100,000 items, and you can see the program really didn't change that much, right? All I did was change the int n at the top to be a bigger number, and the rest of the code just works. Arrays also allow us to do things you just couldn't do otherwise. Here's the problem. We want to reverse a sequence of words. And let's say somebody gives us a file where the first line in the file is a number, and that number specifies how many words are going to be in the file, in this case four. And then they give us the sequence of words. And our job is to print those words out in reverse order. This is easy to do with an array. It'd be you know, more difficult to do without an array. And let me show you. So here's the output. You run Java backwards with four words, and it prints the words out backwards. Here's the code that does that. First thing we're going to do is read in an integer. That's the number four. Once we know four, we know how big to make our array. So what we're going to do is declare an array that's of type string. The array is called words. We create the memory for that array. Then, since this file promised to have four words, we go ahead and make a for loop that goes four times, reading string, 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 string. So it reads in fee, fi, fo, fum, into index position 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then we print them out in reverse order. Since we put them in, in that order, what we do is I made a, a for loop here that goes backwards. It starts at three and works its way down to zero and including zero. The first time this loop runs, i is going to be three, then it's going to be two, then it's going to be one, and then it's going to be zero. So it's going to print out the words in reverse order. And we can run that on the command line. There's my input file. Oops, I've already I've already had a broken input file. Let's fix it. So here's Here's an input file with four words. And I can redirect with the less than symbol. And it's reversed the words, the fox, brown, quick, the. Now, why I had that thing edited, I want to show you. You have to make sure when you're using these standard input methods, what I have now is a file that says there's five words. And if I run my program on that, it's going to actually crash. And it crashes. What does it crash? It crashes on backwards.java line 13. And we can go into Eclipse. Line 13 is this one. And what's happened is I told it was five. So it created an array with five slots. And then it tried to read five strings. And there were only four available. You must be careful with standard in. If you've got an input file, you've got to read the right types and the right number of things. If it gets off, you're going to get some sort of error like uh, I just showed you. If we needed to track, you know, three zombies, what arrays allow us to do in our zombie game now is instead of having that whole set of variables for eat one for a pair for each zombie, we can just make two arrays. We can have an X array for zombie X locations and a Y array for zombie Y locations. And in zombie x bracket 0 and zombie y bracket 0, we'd hold the position of that first zombie. And then in zombie x bracket 1 and zombie y bracket 1, we'd have the position of the second zombie. Instead of having a really big long uh, if statement, now what we do is I created a loop that goes through all the index positions of the zombies and looks for collisions against any of them. If you hit any any zombie, then the game is over and then this exits. So to summarize, we looked today at the command line. And if you haven't used it before, you should uh, uh, definitely, after you're done watching this video, try and open the command line, move around, list some files, maybe uh, write a program or two, compile a program, run a program, play around with it redirect you know things to a file read input from a file maybe try piping things between a program so just play around with it and become comfortable with it it's definitely something we'll be using uh, throughout the course 
we saw how you could read input either interactively from the user or from a file using this uh, standard in.java. And then finally, I showed you how you can create your own arrays in your program, just like the args array, uh, for use in storage of uh, sets of data of a similar type.